So I started very young. And uh, I knew nothing about network marketing. I knew nothing about the industry. My story was very brief because I was very young. I had just, uh, I was in college at the time when I heard a new skin, but just prior to that, I was in the military. And for me to uh, expand my wings, so to speak, and try, try something, a business that was based on skincare products and a hair care product uh, was really foreign to me. I came out of a, 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 a macho military environment, law enforcement, that sort of thing, uh, in my family. And so for me to do something like New Skin was so, so strange for me. But it all, all, the only reason it worked out for me was because of Craig. And Craig Bryson is, without a doubt, the most brilliant person in the network marketing industry. He, he is. He is. He is the Einstein of network marketing. So I only have his hair. I only have his hair. <laughs> First First okay. So I want to take this time to introduce Craig Rice. I had internalized the marketing plan, and I was focused. <laughs> so uh, it was uh, actually we had a great trip, and uh, Monty developed a solid element uh, there uh, in Australia, uh, and Monty has followed. Uh, the world as the company has expanded, and I think uh, I have three big lines, right? Everybody in the company comes from three large lines uh, that Craig Tillis and I uh, drove, and that uh, uh, Monty uh, is the head of the largest line of those three. And so that it, uh, it goes into every uh, corner of the world. And so uh, I appreciate uh, what Monty said in terms of our conversation around uh, his advent in Facebook. That is also a true story. Uh, Monty uh, had uh, been out of business, I would say, for a little while. He had taken a little time off, which is not unusual for uh, leaders. He was making significant amounts of money. And so that uh, we had a discussion, and he said, which way uh, do you think the business is going? And uh, that discussion uh, led to the advent of social networks and the implications that social networks have on the way we do business. And so that uh, Monty, uh, after that initial discussion, uh, Monty disappeared for you know three or four weeks. I was a little surprised because I could tell that he was committed to coming back to the business and driving uh, his lines uh, even further. And that uh, he uh, disappeared for three or four weeks, and then he called me up and said, Craig, uh, I've been doing my own research. And uh, uh, you're right. Uh, this is the way that, uh, that network marketing is going to go. Social media is going to become a communication device. It's going to become uh, you know, one of the foundational principles uh, in uh, in uh, direct sales. And over the course of those eight years, and this isn't unusual, oftentimes technologies are a little slow to get started, but over the course of those uh, eight years, Monty has created the largest online network uh, in the world. He's, he's modest in his numbers. I think he, he runs several groups. Uh, and so he has about 75,000 people that follow him, and his growth rate is significant. And so that he's going to continue to grow and he has developed his influence, uh, not just within the United States, but worldwide as well, because he saw what we're going to talk about early, and he's grown up with the industry, and that industry is going to continue to expand, and its meaning is going to be uh, uh, also going to develop uh, even more importantly uh, in our business, because we are making a transition. And that, that is the message of uh, what I'm going to say this afternoon is that the company is holding this conference right now because they're making the declaration that uh, they're going to change. Uh, they have invested at this point, uh, I think they've invested 20 million, the original spend is for 25 million, and so they uh, uh, have invested significant amounts of money to make a transition in the business. And I'm gonna tell you as an absolute, that $25 million is a down payment on a much larger commitment. Uh, and the reason is, that uh, uh, we're seeing the transition taking place for direct sales. It isn't just in terms of what's gonna happen within uh, New Skin. It's really a larger question of where is direct sales going to take the social media uh, environment. And that these things that, that I'm talking about necessarily aren't, aren't what New Skin is deciding to do. At least in part, they are yielding to the larger trends that are visible to us all. I'm not gonna talk about anything that isn't visible to us all. In other words, I'm not gonna uh, be a futurist up here and say, okay, I'm gonna make a guess in terms of what the future is going to look like. 
I'm really going to extrapolate what is turn, uh, taking place right now in the present, and we're going to extrapolate how that's going to affect our business and the things that people need to do uh, to keep up with the transition that the company is inspiring. And so as you sit in the, these conference rooms, and as you listen to Hazel, and you listen to Emma, uh, and you listen to their stories, and you uh, hear what the company is working on, I want you to appreciate that it is merely a first step. And that in that understanding, you also have to appreciate that the very nature of leadership in direct sales is going to change and change dramatically. And that this is a heads up, I think, that we all should internalize. Is that how you define yourself as a leader, the knowledge that you possess as a leader, some of that knowledge is going to become unimportant. Uh, some of the skills that you have developed and uh, that you rely on to develop your business right now, those skills are going to become unimportant. Oftentimes people are robbed of participation in the future because they can't give up their abilities that they have developed over the past. And because they can't give those up, because they have been valuable in the past, they aren't able to take advantage of the opportunities that are being created in the present. And that this is the warning that I'm going to put out to you. Uh, there is a story that has to do with the Second World War that I think is, is kind of interesting. And I think it also uh, relates to us. During the Second World War, uh, they would train their pilots uh, here on the mainland. And so pilots would be drafted or would volunteer into the Air Force. Uh, they would be trained how to, uh, how to fly. They would be trained in combat maneuvers. Uh, they would be given an extensive course. And through that extensive course, some people would wash out. They wouldn't uh, be able to make it through the training. Uh, they were, uh, because the aircraft was flimsy and, and mechanically uncertain, uh, many of them crashed in the training itself and lost their lives. And so as a consequence, uh, the training itself was difficult. <laughs> Then they took them in the Pacific Theater and they uh, deposited them in uh, Hawaii. And that uh, they're going to go through the last bit of training before they went out into combat. And they put them in meetings just like this. And this is what they said to them. Half of you are going to die. That was just statistically accurate. Half of you in these rooms, in those rooms, are just going to die, and you have to accept that as a reality. Uh, the most incredible thing about that is that they said that in those meetings, everyone began to look at each other uh, to, as they looked around to see who was going to die, because they couldn't internalize that actually they were going to be a part of the downside of that statistic, uh, and that they soon uh, learned as they went out into the field how death could uh, arrive at the door uh, of, uh, of a pilot because they flew over thousands of miles of open water, if their plane got damaged, if their engine was damaged, if there uh, was damage to their communication system, if their damage to their, their gasoline, if their lights went out and they couldn't find their, uh, their aircraft carrier, they could fly right past them and die. And many of those pilots would die because uh, they just dropped silently into the sea uh, into the night because their planes couldn't make it back to safety. What I'm saying to you right now is I don't want anyone in this room to die in a new skin sense because a transition is taking place, something that is monumental, and that you're, a lot of people are going to look at this and you're going to say to yourself, ah, I can't do that. Oh my goodness, I, you know, uh, it's beyond me to, to progress with the company uh, if this is the route we're going to take. What I'm saying to you right now, first of all, is that you don't have to change. No one is going to uh, make you change in terms of how you pursue the business. You can continue to pursue the business as uh, it now exists and that you can go on and you can uh, have a business. But what is that going to occur over time is the market that you're going to be able to penetrate into, the market that's going to judge how successful that you're going to be on the upper side of the potential, that market is going to shrink. The reason is, is that communication is changing. I was talking to a team of leaders, a wonderfully intelligent uh, woman who works the business part, who understands uh, how the business works. And that, uh, in that discussion, she said to me, 
as we just uh, talked about the millennial group, she said, Craig, I hate working with these young people. Uh, and uh, she said, the problem is, is that you have to teach them how to use the telephone. <laughs> I want you to think about that for a second. Is that first of all, she was making a, a profound observation. She was, she was working into the millennial group, uh, but she found that they didn't want to talk on the, uh, on the telephone. And so she thought that the way she had to overcome that is that she was going to teach this person how they should talk on the telephone. Their communication vehicle should be on the telephone. The problem is, in order for that person to become successful, they have to change the way that people communicate across the entire demographic spectrum of their warm market. Because the, she's not going to be able to change everybody in the millennial group how to talk on the telephone. And so she, she took what was a profound observation, that they didn't talk on the telephone like her generation did, but she turned it into a negative. Instead of saying, I have to figure out how communication is going to work in the future. So that I can communicate with that group, with that individual, with the group that comes in uh, from her downline, so I can be a full participator and I can influence and motivate those people who are communicating in a different way. T-Mobile just announces this to confirm this, is they're looking at creating a subscri uh, subscription that doesn't have wireless telephone ability at all. At all. It allows the people uh, to do this subscription to save $30 a month, so that it's going to save them $360 a year, and that there's no doubt that they didn't make this uh, uh, subscription off uh, opportunity based on, you know, fly-by-night judgment. They did it off of data. And that they realized that the younger generation didn't care too much about cellular connection. They communicated through Facebook, through data transfer, through pictures, uh, and that they also then communicated uh, when they were in Wi-Fi hotspots, uh, both free and free. And so that <coughs> her observation was acute. Her, uh, her uh, conclusions from that observation were not. Everyone here has to appreciate that what we're talking about is communication. No one in this room, uh, certainly of my generation, would have ever thought that they could pursue their business uh, by not using the telephone. Uh, that would be illogical. But there are people who are going to believe that they can pursue their business without using the social means of uh, exchange that has becoming dominant uh, in the, the world of the younger half of our market. And so let's, let's understand that. Let's also say that there, none of this is, uh, is, has to do with IQ. In other words, everyone has sat there and looked at uh, technologies and all the time. I don't understand that. You call your teenager over and say, can you explain this to me? Can you do this for me? Uh, you know, uh, and that's just the way it is. Uh, I uh, was amused at an article I read that, that they gave a, 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 a cassette tape to a teenager and he couldn't figure out how to use it. Uh, you know, it's just a different way, a different technology than the one you uh, were raised in. And so no one is precluded from participating in this world uh, because it's too complex, the techno uh, technology is too hard. That's just not true. It's just a function of will. It's a decision that you make, that you're going to master this uh, uh, area. And the moment, the moment you make that decision, uh, first of all, it lowers the, the, the nervousness that is attached to, them, uh, to this and so that you need to, uh, uh, you need to push forward. I also believe, and I think you should uh, push the company uh, along with me, that the company should be running, uh, at least at the uh, onset, they should be running some type of program for people who are starting at the basics in terms of uh, technology, uh, so that, that the, uh, the, the, the older generation, to, to draw a generality, the older generation can cut, uh, catch up with the new generation. And that the sooner they begin that, the better off we all will be, so that we can all communicate across, uh, let's say, modern means. Can you say that again, Craig? What do you mean? Would you just say a second generation? I believe that the company should be running uh, training meetings at the beginning, so that those people who come in and say, oh, you know, I was at the bank the other day, and uh, a woman came in, and I was setting up a business account. A woman came in talking to the, the officer in the next uh, cubicle. And she said, 
don't tell me about the internet. I don't know anything about the internet. I, you know, just leave me alone about the internet. I need to know, you know, uh, this or that, and I don't connect here. And so the, the company needs to, uh, uh, to provide a pathway so everyone can start wherever they are. I mean, if we were to take a group, we'd have experts, we'd have people who are engaged in this, and we'd have uh, uh, people who are just getting started. And the company needs to accept that there's a starting point and they need to train people so that they all, and we all can feel comfortable in the discussion. And the reason I say this is because the business and the nature of the business uh, and the nature of leadership is not going to remain the same. It is not going to remain the same. There was an article that I read not too long ago uh, that had to, to do with, the, I think the title of it was, uh, The Death of Expertise. The Death of Expertise. Uh, what the article is about is that many uh, little small businesses that used to rely on esoteric knowledge, uh, that, uh, and they interviewed a woman who was an expert in wine, and that she said uh, that, uh, yeah, people would call her up and they would pay her and she would teach them about wine selection. It would, uh, they would be taught about uh, uh, wine investment. And so she would be able to take her esoteric knowledge and she translated that into a business uh, that paid her money. And she said, that business is done. There is no business. And the reason is, of course, is that if people want to know about wine, they're going to Google it up and they're going to get that expertise for free uh, across the Internet. And that all these little businesses uh, that used to exist based on information, uh, those businesses are going to disappear uh, because no one has a need for that because everything is, uh, is, is Googleable, searchable, and is free. And so uh, those businesses are going to disappear. The death of expertise also, can, as you look at it, also is going to apply to us as leaders. If you want someone to explain the marketing plan, you don't need to learn the marketing plan, right? You can have them uh, Google up. They can have Scott Schwert explain the marketing plan to them. They don't need you to explain the marketing plan. Uh, if you want to explain uh, someone to explain how the business works and sponsorship and those sort of things, you don't have to do it. You can go on YouTube and you can have some ex successful distributor uh, I'll go up and do that presentation, and probably do that presentation better than you can. If you want to edit that in a foreign language, you can find someone who will do it in a foreign language, certainly better than you can. And so, as a consequence, you begin to look and say, my goodness, what on earth does the company need us for? I don't want them to stop paying me the big dollars uh, when they decide that my information that I have carefully curated over the course of the last 34 years suddenly has no value whatsoever. The thing is that the need for leadership doesn't disappear. It just changes. And that change actually makes the leaders even more important than they were before if you correctly understand what those changes are. So, <clears throat> if it's not that, then what is it? All of you probably have uh, used a, a travel site, either Travelocity or uh, one of those sites. Uh, and there's, there's about three or four that dominate uh, the industry. Uh, when I was young in the business and I was doing lots of uh, traveling, I had a travel agent. And I would call up that travel agent and I would say, okay, I'm going to be in New York on Monday, I'm going to be in Philadelphia on Tuesday, I'm going to be in, uh, you know, in Miami on Wednesday. And so I would go through my list and she would not only book my pl that flight, but she would also make reservations for hotels. And then she would ask me where I wanted to stay and where I was going to do the meetings. And so she would make booking. And uh, she, because it was time intensive, she would get 5% of, uh, of my business. And so that's how travel agents work. They get 5%. So travel agents, by and large, have been put, in, uh, put out of the business by, uh, by uh, Travelocity and those, uh, their, their brother, uh, uh, those brother companies. And you say to yourself, because it's an electronic connection, there's no human being involved, so they don't have to pay for later. They're not going to be paid 5%. They're going to be paid somewhat less than that. But you know what? They're paid more than that. And you know what? They're paid much more than that. 
pay 25 to 30 percent. There are some predictions that say their pay is going to be up to 50 percent. They just raised the, the rate they're uh, charging the hotel and that they think that it could all go all the way up to 50 percent. And you say to yourself, why? What is taking place here that would uh, allow them uh, to charge 25, 35, and perhaps higher amounts of money for those reservations? That boils down to this, is that if you Google up hotel rooms in New York City, you're gonna get five million responses. Five million. And so that what those uh, sites do is that they don't add to the mix of information, they subtract from the mix of information. And so that they uh, bring it into a manageable form so that people can use the information uh, that is readily available uh, on the internet and to the public in general. And that for that, they're going to get increasing amounts of money. When you look in terms of a leader, especially in terms of a leader in an environment that is changing as rapidly as it's changing right now, is that the leader is going to have to sit through the uh, environment to give people a legitimate pathway as opposed to letting them become lost in the YouTube presentations and in the, the search results that come off Google is that it's going to be a process of subtraction rather a process of addition. That means the leader is going to have to develop a different set of skills. They're going to have to develop a set of skills of sifting and aggregation as opposed to the skills and the time that they're spending to develop those skills uh, in terms of explaining the marketing plan. It isn't going to be any addition of time, it's just going to be a rearrangement of time, and there's going to be a transition uh, as that occurs. But uh, it's something, it's a skill that you're going to have to come to understand. The other thing that I think that should be uh, understood as well is that networks have value, and that value is different than the monetization that takes place within a network uh, of news channels. Let me explain uh, what I mean. So Monty's got a deadline. You're going to hear from her uh, at this uh, at this conference. Uh, her name is Holly Holmes. Holly uh, is uh, down in Dallas, uh, and she is wonderful in terms of her internet knowledge. And the reason she is, is about 10 years ago, she created a blog, and she now has 1.9 million followers on her blog. And so uh, she has created an income stream based on content that she has penetrated into a group of people, and this is her circle of influence, right? I mean, those of you who've been in the business, you've all heard the discussion about circle of influence, and I used to go out and say, oh, boy, uh, you know, the average circle of influence is uh, uh, maybe uh, 75 people, maybe 100, but the true uh, number of circle of influence is 1,000. Well, that was all time thinking. There are people out there who have circles of influences that go into the hundreds of thousands, into the millions, and Holly Holmes is one of those people. She has a circle of influence of 1.9 million people that she communicates with <clears throat> virtually every day. This is the changing nature of how the business works. Holly Holmes is important to me uh, because uh, she's working on how to make the transition of what is called light content, weak contact, and trying to, to create an environment where she can take those weak contacts contacts, because she doesn't know these people personally, uh, and take those weak contacts and turn them into a pathway where she can sell product to them and she can sell uh, 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 the opportunity to them as well. <clears throat> this is different. This is the nature of circle of influence and that Holly Holmes is important not just to me, she's important to you, because the moment she figures that out, that pathway can be used by you to go to people that you know that have uh, you know, 10,000, 15,000 followers on Instagram, have uh, you know, uh, you know, a million people who follow them on Facebook, and you can go to them. And the one thing all these people are interested in is how they can monetize their network. And you can show them how they can monetize their network. We're waiting for that pathway to be developed 
the moment that pathway is developed, then there's going to be a gold rush, so to speak, to show people how they can monetize those large numbers on their uh, Instagram or Facebook or any of these uh, electronic networks. But you have to appreciate, in terms of me saying this, is that Holly Holmes' network has value separate from Newscan. You, I want all of you to start thinking in terms of networks, uh, your network, not just in terms of your network as it is constituted today, but the network that you can develop over a period of years. It took Holly Holmes 10 years to develop a network of 1.9 million people. We have people in this room who are developing followers, uh, not just Monty, but people are uh, developing followers uh, in these networks. And that, that development is going to be slow at first, but it's going to follow the mathematical formula that we see in so many different places, and we certainly see in the network that we build them in the past, and that is two turns into four, four turns into eight, eight turns into 16, 16 then moves to 32, 32 turns into uh, uh, 64, and that all seems so slow, it seems so sluggish, it seems so wrong and hard, until you hit that point where 10,000 turns into 20,000 and 20,000 turns into 40,000. It is what takes place in terms of the networks that we build through the, uh, the nature of Niskin's volume and genealogy. And so that if you develop a network as you move along, if you collect people who perhaps aren't interested necessarily in terms of buying new skin products today, but you invite them to share or follow you in terms of your network, then you are developing a network that is independent of new skin. And that uh, network is independent of new skin's uh, restrictions and new skin's uh, uh, rules to a certain extent. And, uh, and so you can collect those people and that that has value for you. And the bigger it gets, the more valuable it becomes. I want to tell you also that this will change the relationship between New Skin and their distributors. This is the natural outcropping of computers. If you go back to the early days of computers, this is what you saw, is that uh, computers were big machines that would fill this room. IBM would have computers that would fill this room and they would crunch the numbers and that uh, only a few people, big corporations and governments could have that computers. And that would put the big corporation and government, it would put information at their fingertips. And so power and authority moved to that information that was clustered into small little areas. Uh, with the advent of uh, personal computing, information started to be confused individuals started to become more important and that it was in a very real sense a rebellion. The moment those computers then connected to the internet where information began to search the world is that uh, you cannot have a centralized business anymore. Uh, there, is no, there is no small little control uh, over a centralized business. We are living in an age of transparency. Everything is going to be exposed. And so as you develop your own organization, and as you control that organization, and you will hold it through the content that you aggregate, then you will develop uh, a, a power uh, position, especially clustered with other uh, distributors, uh, that will become equal, and there will be more of a partnership between this skin and the distributors. And I think that is a good thing, and it certainly is part of the environment that we live in today and that uh, it will open up lots of opportunities for income uh, that uh, will be different than it is right now. So I want you to understand that. Develop your network step by step. It will happen slowly. Some of you will choose not to, and that's fine. Some of you will attach yourself to larger networks, and that's fine. Uh, uh, but networks will have values separate, distinct than new skin, and the monetization that it takes in new skin and eventually it will provide for you uh, for avenues uh, to, uh, uh, to do lots of things. Everything from advertising in that network to selling that network. It's hard to sell a direct sales company uh, because everything is so personal. And so that when people want to sell, let's say they want to retire, it's a hard thing for them to do. 
Uh, but uh, if that is attached to a million people who have a network that your network <coughs> suddenly it has an independent value that you can uh, that you can sell if you decide to quit Nuskin and retire. And so it changes the nature of the business, it changes the nature of what you're doing, it changes the nature of how you proceed in the business. And that's what we're seeing. And the company is going to facilitate that because what I've just said, they understand. And they're going to facilitate that because they know that by doing it, they're going to increase the pie. And that means there's going to be so much more money that's available by the, the things that they're doing is that they're going to give away perhaps some of the control that they've had historically. And in that process, they're going to create a return that is much bigger, much larger, much more lucrative for the participants than what we have ever seen before. Let me, let me discuss that comment before I move on. <clears throat> All wealth comes from productivity. All wealth comes from productivity. Uh, can you do things more productive than your competitors? Uh, wealth centers on productivity. Uh, and that uh, once you understand that and you start to connect it to this to the social world and uh, the communication uh, vehicles that are created within that world, you can see how productivity starts to enlarge. In other words, you can communicate with everybody in your downline all at once. You don't have to call each individual person uh, or even do it a conference call that has to do with time and place. Well, uh, you can uh, communicate with people in a different manner or you do a periscope and that uh, people can watch you uh, and that they can uh, look at the, uh, uh, they can look at the, uh, the, the recorded version. And so uh, what we're seeing, of course, is a communication vehicle that will increase our productivity and all wealth comes from productivity increase. But when you do the study on that, you see that there is a certain hiccup in this. And I want to explain this to you so you understand what you're seeing as it uh, unfolds right before your eyes. <laughs> a man by the name of Rob, uh, Robert Solow, he was an economist from the University of California at Berkeley, uh, he did a study in the 1950s that said uh, everything, all the wealth that the United States created from the time of the beginning of the Industrial Revolution to into the 1950s had come through technical advance. And that uh, this was revolutionary in terms of people thinking of how wealth was, concern, uh, was controlled. He then in the 19, uh, the late 1970s into the 1980s also looked and said, you know what, we've seen the personal computer come into the world. We see IT, information technology, come into the world, but we're not seeing any increase in terms of wealth. Uh, that means this investment in IT isn't turning out to be uh, productive and uh, wealth creating in terms of the adoption. But as the other economists looked at this, they said, you know what? This isn't, that isn't true. And they began to look back into a similar situation uh, with the advent of electricity. People knew that electricity was going to transform the industrial world. And so companies invested in electricity. They took out their steam engines and they put in its place electric engines. And productivity did nothing. It didn't change anything. Nothing changed for 20 years. And then the people uh, who ran those, uh, uh, those uh, industrial complexes began to retire and disappear. And the uh, new generation stepped into that. And they said, why are we having a centralized power source? We don't need that anymore. We can diffuse that, and instead of having everything circle around our power source, we can take that power and make it so we facilitate the construction and the development of our product. And so they diffused it, and now the decision wasn't about the power source. The decision was about how can we uh, you know, take that power and make the creation of whatever product they were making flow more smoothly, uh, uh, without as much labor, and over, once they started to recognize that, once that generation passed, once the new form of uh, business started to be incorporated, then productivity, and with it, wealth and profits began to uh, explode to where over the next 20 years, uh, uh, they increased their profits by uh, three times. Three times. It is a huge transformation. 
right? A huge transformation if you can increase your profits by three times over a period of time. But it only happens because the older people who were welded to the past vacated the premises and those people who were raised with the new power sources realized that a change had to take place and that they created the form and the function of that. That is the importance of Hazel Calvert and Emma Carpenter. The, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the social media has been out there for a while. I mean, it's not something new, but so, uh, they came in and they changed the nature of how the business used it. And that they did, and doing that, and, and the company's not here, so I'm going to speak candidly. <laughs> Actually, I only know how to speak candidly. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't serve me well. But <clears throat> part of what has taken place in the UK isn't in terms of only adoption. It was rejection. They rejected things. Let's take a look and see what Emma and Hazel rejected when you really look at how they run the business. They rejected high-priced products, right? They rejected age loss. The products that they sell uh, were products of uh, the facelift. This is mesmerizing to me because the facelift was part of the product array that I knew when I first stepped in the business. I looked at that product array, the things that she sold, and I said, my goodness, these are things that I personally put on people's faces uh, when I first uh, started the business, the facelift, Marine Mud, uh, uh, AP24, they took and they realized the market they were going to go in. And that market was a young market who didn't care anything about aging. Because we know young people are stupid. <laughs> we know that. Because they think they're not going to age. And it's not true. It's a lie. It's a lie. Let me tell you. It's going to happen. Uh, but that, that sense of uh, that they're not worried about it today, uh, they weren't, uh, their, her market didn't have that sense. So they so pay higher prices for products that were not readily seen as something that they would be interested in. Uh, they understood they had to do something else. And so they chose lower prices to match the millennial generation as they saw it. And so they started to match things up, right? Lower prices, beauty-based products, so, lower prices, beauty-based products, that's a match. They also gave up the kit system. They didn't care about the kit system, which is another way to raise price of entry into the business. And they didn't want to raise the price of entry into the business. And so they had lower products uh, that were youth emphasized, and they also coupled it in uh, to uh, uh, rejecting the kit system that raised the cost to participate in the business, and that they, they rejected those things. They rejected the concept, which was for older people. They rejected the prices, which tended to be for old, older people that had money, which narrowed their uh, markets even uh, more. And that they uh, uh, then, on top of that, they began to use social media as social confirmation of those people who were moving forward so they would have day-to-day -day confirmation that people were being successful. And they created an environment of mutual support in that. They didn't give away meetings. They still got together. They still had meetings and had personal social interaction as well. But they used it as something on top of the things that they were dealing with. Now, this is important because increasingly in a decentralized world, uh, we're going to see go forward strategies that come out of the field as opposed that are created by a small number of people within the company. It has to work that way. If you have, if you look at a uh, uh, four digit combination, so four digit combination, there are 10,000 possibilities uh, that, that you can arrange yourself before you strike on the combination that will open a lot. And so that if you wanted just to accidentally find, randomly find a combination, you would have to have 10,000, you'd sit there and run through the numbers 10,000 numbers before you were sure to find the one that would open the lock. But if you had 10,000 people doing it, it would take you instantaneously. And that is what I'm putting forward, is increasingly the economy is saying centralized development of strategies 
isn't as good as a decentralized development of strategies where you're involving the intellectual ability uh, and the, uh, the observation of a large group of people. And in a world that is changing so rapidly, that is one of our major advantages. And so that we see not just uh, uh, Hazel and, and Emma, but we also see uh, people in Thailand and in South uh, Latin America and in China that are doing the same thing. And that, you know what? We're better off in that environment to where those solutions to problems will then be uh, shared within networks and that we can take those solutions to uh, uh, advance ourselves. And that means that we're more productive, with greater profitability, that means the opportunity is unbelievably higher. And that is one of the things that is, is to our advantage. We have a network of people who are focused on the same thing we're focused on, and solutions to day-to-day -day problems can be arrived at more quickly, more readily, and it's a marketing advantage for us. And we need to understand that as we create networks and then have those networks uh, share with one another. Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk about Apple for a second. I hate Apple. <laughs> That's not true. Uh, I mean, so I have my phone, and uh, I, you know, I've got an Apple computer, and I've got an iPad, uh, and so I'm deeply involved with Apple. Uh, but what I hate about Apple is that everyone uses Apple as a business example. Right? I mean, and I'm sick to death of hearing about Apple as a business example. But I'm about to give you a business example that features Apple. And so I need to apologize. <clears throat> how many of you, how many of you have uh, been watching the American uh, election process, the primary process? Okay. I'm so sad uh, about all of this. Uh, you know, I look across the, the selection. I won't get into it. But I do have, I do have Donald Trump hair. <laughs> I'm hopeful he starts a craze and I can be modern. Uh, <laughs> So what we have here uh, is an interesting situation uh, within the, uh, the primary of the Republican Party. You have a businesswoman, and, she, and you have to admit, Carly Fiorina was a dynamic president. She started to rise, and she started. She had a little boomlet, and she based that boomlet on the fact that she had led Hewlett Packard, and that she had created uh, the largest uh, uh, desktop computer company in the world by uh, doing a deal to take over a compact computer. And she went on uh, you know, her stump speech, speeches and she talked about the success and the size of the, uh, of the success that she had by arranging Hewlett Packard's takeover of a compact. Her boomlet was short-circuited because it didn't withstand the scrutiny. And that what she did, of course, is that she borrowed lots of money to buy a company that was in desktop computers when desktop computers market was starting to stall and shrink. And that so, yes, for that moment, she did something that was noteworthy. But in terms of a futurist, in terms of looking forward, in terms of, of building out the future for Hewlett Packard, she made a mistake. And once it was exposed, then her stock quickly went down, even though she was a dynamic debater, even though she had knowledge that was significant, people looked at that and realized that she had made a fundamental mistake in that business decision. At the very same time, you had Steve Jobs take over Apple again. He was thrown out by the shareholders, and that uh, Apple wandered around in the wilderness, and in 2001, he comes back into the uh, or 2002, he comes back into the company, and uh, 2000, anyway, in the early 2000s, and so <laughs> these two things are taking place simultaneously. Uh, Carly Fiorina, she makes a judgment, and that judgment is about the past. Jobs comes in, and 
he makes a judgment about the future. And that judgment was he was going to do mobile. And he started off with an iPad or an iPod. And that uh, that iPod put his, you know, put him, placed him in mobile. It took him out of, uh, of just, you know, personal computer. And so it was the first step. And that first year that they introduced the iPod, they did five point something billion in business. And so they kept growing in terms of that. And then they took the second step and they came out uh, with the iPhone. And then on the year, the, the first year the iPhone came in, they were now doing 24 billion in business. And so the iPod had taken them from 5.4 billion to 24 billion dollars. Uh, these are rough numbers because I'm not doing decimals in there. <coughs> now they're doing somewhere around, I think, about 240 billion dollars. All right? So when you take a look, you see what took place with Apple. Is that it wasn't a straight line projection. Is what they did is that they made a decision when Carly Fiorina was going back and uh, doubling her bet on the desktop. Uh, what, uh, Steve Jobs went forward on mobile because by that time it was obvious that the world was moving toward mobile. So he's willing to step in. He's not the only competitor uh, in terms of uh, the iPhone. Uh, he wasn't the only uh, competitor in terms of mobile music, but he put out a better product and he transitioned into these markets as they started to explode. And he, uh, he created a platform. I want you to understand that because that's a word that you're going to hear. He created a platform with the addition of, uh, <laughs> with the addition of, uh, of his music business is that he started to create a platform off of which he could build all these different things. Nuskin is going to talk about platform because they're going to build a platform for your participation. And platforms are, is important. They're going to build a platform. They're going to do online ordering. And we'll, I'll finish up with that. But anyway, and so you can see what took place. He made a, a, a decision that carried him into the future. Uh, Carly, Fina, uh, Connor, Carly Fiorina, she made a, a, a decision that carried her into the past. And that... Uh, what I'm saying to you is that you all have to make the decision to go into the future because that's where the higher profits are and making a transition from the old way of doing things to the new way of doing things. And that uh, uh, that's what everyone in this room has to make a commitment to do. You have to make a commitment to step into the future and that there is more, uh, more income out there because of it. <coughs> Okay, uh, before I turn it over uh, to, uh, to Moni, Moni's gonna go through more basic uh, things. The company has invested 25 million when it's done, and it's the first step. What they're doing is that they're creating a step. That's all it is, it's a step. For us to climb up on What Steve Jobs did, is that by going into the, with the iPod, he created a step. And that from the iPod, he then step, stepped up and he did uh, the iPhone and then the iPad. He took steps as he migrated deeper and deeper into mobile. If you want to look at other people who have done this, uh, look at Netflix. How many of you use Netflix? Okay. The <coughs> so Netflix founder, uh, he didn't want to sell or to rent DVDs. That's where he started the business. He, he rented DVDs uh, by mail. But he didn't want to. He always wanted to be in stream. That's where he always wanted to be. But he realized he had to be a participant, right? He had to be in the music dispensing business. And when streaming became uh, uh, profitable, that he would have a position in that world. And so he decided he would start in the rental business. And that created a step for him. And that when streaming came in, he was positioned to take advantage of streaming. So he could step up in streaming. And he was positioned to do so. And now, because he's in streaming and the uh, uh, dispensing of content, he's taken another step, which is in content <coughs> creation. He's creating uh, his own uh, content, original content, 
and he's selling that original content across uh, his uh, cross network. And so he did the same thing. He proceeded step by step by step. That's what Niskin's doing. This is merely the first step. That's all it is. We need to gravitate to it. We need to understand it. Because I can promise you as an absolute, they're going to create a next step. And the next step will be more profitable than the first step. And then they'll take a step after that as they advance themselves into the world and that you can see it in what they're doing. You can see it in the fact that uh, they're going to do free shipping, right? Free shipping. Yes. How can we be competitive without free shipping? You can. That means they're going to be competitive in the world of online ordering. They're going to deal with prices, right? If you, 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 you gravitate over to Truman and ask him what he's going to do about prices, I can tell you, they're going to deal with prices. Because how can you be competitive unless you deal with prices on the internet? So they're going to deal with shipping, they're going to deal with prices, they're going to deal with online ordering, they're going to deal with all these issues that open up a wider world of competition. And that that wider world of competition offers us tremendous amounts of return as they develop these abilities. Now you look at our major competitors in this world, and uh, I hate everyone who is a major competitor. <laughs> <laughs> Amazon, right? How do you beat Amazon? Amazon is everywhere. I hate Amazon. Uh, you know, they're everywhere. So. <laughs> yeah, I hate Amazon. So I've got this apartment in Paris, and I say, I, I need to buy a few things. And so I go to Amazon Paris, Amazon France, and I order everything I need, and have, have them shipped. And so I hate Amazon. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so Amazon is going to be unbelievably competitive. Everything they do. I mean, Jeff Bezos is a monster. He's a monster. And he is going to try to take over the world. He is confronting Walmart. And his, he wants to sell everything to everybody. And he wants to crush Walmart like a bug. <laughs> and he's doing a darn good job. One of the competitive advantages that he's uh, creating is in delivery, right? Mm -hmm. In delivery. The world is delivery. Let's talk about revolutions. I'm taking your time, Monty. Give me just a second. Then I'll right. The world of delivery is in an uproar. It is one of the biggest, most revolutionary uh, areas of, uh, of industry right now. The world of delivery. And it starts with automated cars. 2004, every uh, leader in technology said, there'll never be an automated car. The reason is there's too much uh, digestion information and has to go in. There's too much need in terms of visual uh, observation, and so no one's going to build an automated car. Right? So, what was it, three, four years ago, Google started to run an automated car around, uh, around uh, California, uh, around their Mountain View uh, uh, home, and that they have now logged uh, a million miles with their automated car fleet. They're not the only one. Uh, Mercedes just put three automated trucks on the road in Europe. Big trucks, big trucks, right, big trucks. And Mercedes is not making any uh, uh, any bones about what they're doing. They're being open and uh, obvious about their intention. They bought two companies that were doing the same thing as Uber. So they bought two companies doing the same thing as Uber, and they have announced that they don't <coughs> consider themselves uh, uh, an automobile company, that they are an urban transportation. I want you to understand the meaning of that transition. They're not a car company. They're an urban transportation company. What that means is their intention is they're going to create automated cars and trucks, and they're going to compete with every taxi out there. They're going to compete with the delivery uh, uh, businesses, and they're going to increase their potential because they're going to be a competitor uh, in the world of delivery and that they're going to use those resources that they have, and they're going to use those resources to be uh, to put the trucking business out of business and the taxi business out of business and a whole lot of other people out of business. And they're not the only ones. Ford, Cadillac, they're all 
uh, going down this road. And so that you can see the automotive car coming at you where the, just 12, 13 years ago they were saying this is an impossibility. It's rushing at you. Uh, uh, the federal government allocated $4 billion to facilitate this. They just uh, said that they will accept, they, the process to accept a computer as a driver has started. And so that you can see it's all rushing at them. And it's going to happen, not in 10 years uh, or 15 years. It's going to happen in the next three or four years. And so what does that mean? It means, first of all, job loss. It's going to be unbelievable attacks to them. But it also means that a revolution is taking place in delivery. So Amazon is going to have people are going to have cars that will deliver their product. Honda says that they've got an automatic car that works that costs twenty thousand dollars and starts their entry into the automatic car world. And so, automated auto, automated cars are not going to be terribly expensive. How does that deal with us? What does the automatic car does to us? It means the distributors, who are the keeper of a network, can take orders and that they can compete with Amazon in terms of delivery time. Amazon wants to deliver to within an hour. That means the distributors can deliver product within an hour. I mean, think of the implications. Prices come down, networks are created, orders are taken, delivery takes place within an hour. It's something the company can't do, but the distributors can do. And it changes the very nature of the business that we're in. In the same way that Mercedes is no longer calling themselves a car company, that they are a, 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 an urban transportation company, the very nature of our business will change as well. Because we'll be able to take orders and deliver in the same competitive environment with Amazon. We are at a transition point. The potential that exists from this point forward is going to be much larger than it has from this point backwards. Everyone, I don't want to leave anyone in this room. I want everyone in this room not to fall silently into the sea uh, because your engine uh, is, has been damaged. I want you to, to take a deep breath, <coughs> learn the, the basics. The company is going to create a step that will be followed by another step, that will be followed by another step, and you follow with them as they expand the opportunity that's attached to new skin. And that everyone can do it. And like I said, the opportunity is enlarging the same way that produ uh, productivity increased uh, industrialization by three times. That's, that's at least, that's the minimum that we can see. I appreciate your time. Thanks a lot. We appreciate it.